Thanks everyone for joining us today for another webinar from the host broker. Um, and we're really happy today to have an excellent guest. Uh, this is a man who has been described as the true founder of the SMB IT community by Carl Pal Palachuk. Uh, he is the CEO of SMB Nation, uh, which is coming up on 22 years uh, in business. He's also the founder of 420 MSP, uh, hosts many industry events and uh, has written many books on uh, the MSP industry, including the Pocket MBA, which is what we're going to be talking about today. So I'm very happy to have Harry Brelsford with us today. And uh, Harry, I'll let you take it over from there. All right. And uh, Devin, just to confirm, you can see my screen since I'm the host. Yes, I can. Okay, great. I'm going to go to slide two. Folks, we're Talking about the Pocket MBA, uh, Finder, Minder, Grinder. So first of all, let me do some introductions. Um, Harry Brelsford, uh, 32 years in the rain in Seattle. And Devin, you may not know, but six months ago, I relocated to Austin, Texas. I uh, got tired of the rain and I like to ride my bike and I need sun. So folks, uh, you know, hit me up on LinkedIn. If, if you'd ever like to meet up, that'd be great. And I do go back and forth a little bit. But pertinent to today... Um, the book I did, I guess it's probably been out about a year, The Pocket MBA. So what happened, Devin, is uh, it's been out about a year and a half. Um, I Number one, I had a trademark, uh, Pocket MBA, I wasn't really taken advantage of. And then number two, with the pandemic, that's when I sat down and started typing. And the answer is very simple. I had more time on my hands than I realized I would without as much travel to events and so on. So I took an old book I did in 2003 about how to be a small business con server consultant and rewrote it as the Pocket MBA Instant Entrepreneur. And so, of course, my bias is towards the MSP community, but I want people today to think of outside just the MSP community that you're actually um, most likely a founder, owner, operator of a small business yourself. And the idea being that um, a business lecture is always timely. It's never green type lecture we're having today, but always timely. And I appreciate you attending. Um, Devin, if people want to in chat and you want to shout out one or two locations, I believe you're in Vancouver. Folks, you're welcome to chat it up on where you're located. That's always interesting. While we're doing that, uh, let's get going. Um, so the finder aspects, finder is uh, get the business, minder is manage the business, and grinder is, is do the work. So we're going to cover finder, minder, grinder, a you know traditional professional services um, paradigm. So what I did with the book is I broke it up into fiscal quarters. Now we're going to say a fiscal quarter is 12 weeks. It's actually, I think, 13 weeks. Uh, but you got to have a, you know, you got to have a little vacation time and holiday time. So for our purposes, a fiscal quarter is 12 weeks. And I came up with the rules of 12. So each week you should be doing something, right? And it is akin to uh, if you go to Weight Watchers or Nutra Systems and you have a, a report card where you can score calories, right? And to some extent, it doesn't matter where those calories come from as long as I'm gonna say you're below 2000 calories a day. And so that's kind of what I do with this scoring system. The main thing is, is to be consistent. Um, that's how I grew my business uh, organically over the years. Um, I'll talk in the grinder section about maybe, you know, with some new opportunities out there, you need to be a little more strategic and grow faster. But the main thing under any business scenario is consistency. So we're going to talk uh, business development versus ring the bell. I have advised uh, a number of businesses, I guess you'd kind of call it a side hustle to running SMB Nation, but I just kind of get brought into conversations. And I'm a real believer in the educational sales approach, the business development approach, right? And here's, you know, I, I borrowed this artwork from uh, Anna Vitel. Um, where it, she walks us through how to sell anything, right? Gain their trust, educate them, be optimistic. Uh, here again, follow up, consistent follow up, and, and then get them to yes and, and ask for the business. Versus ring the bell. I've worked with some firms uh, in, in our space that have sort of a car dealer, car lot mentality. How, you know, how, how many sales did you make today? Did you ring the bell? 
those don't tend to result in relationships, right? That's more, you want to sell the car. <laughs> you want to sell the car and you never see them again. <laughs> so I'm really big on uh, the business development approach. So let's do some finder activities. Uh, the rules of 12, uh, LinkedIn lookalikes. Um, so I, I've drawn this from a startup I did in the predictive analytics area where we talk about lookalikes and nearest next door neighbor. And those are personas, right, that we target. And so uh, just this morning, I was reviewing a confidential document um, about a large MSP on the East Coast, about $40 million that's trying to be acquired. And they target uh, life sciences, professional services, law, firm and, law firms, and healthcare. <clears throat> well, if we go to law firms, um, and I have my own image up uh, from LinkedIn, a um, little bit older uh, screenshot. But if you go over to the far right over here, you'll see that these are my nearest next door neighbors or lookalikes. Um, that, that LinkedIn, the algorithm is very good about suggesting uh, folks you wanna hang out with and do business with. So here again, if you're working with a law partner, um, it's likely that people also viewed other law partners over on the far right. And some of you will recognize those two names. Paul Dippel is a well-known quantitative analyst in the MSP community, does some really good research. Dave Seibert uh, is known for having a quarterly show in Southern California, a little meetup. But that makes sense, uh, Devin, that if you were trying to work with me or you work with me and you wanted uh, similar birds of a feather, those two fit that category. And then again, I suggest you do this once a week. Um, quite frankly, most of us are in LinkedIn all day, every day. So it's not even a super big challenge to go friend people and, and target these uh, personas that make sense. And I'll, I'll add to that too, Harry. And yes, I, sir. you might touch on this, I'm not sure. But um, you know, we've been doing some, some lead generation programs which are utilizing LinkedIn as a data mining source and use, utilizing yes, LinkedIn Sales Navigator specifically. Um, and that is a, you know, another way to kind of tap into LinkedIn's algorithm and, and their in, uh, artificial intelligence in terms of finding the right contacts as well. So I totally agree, LinkedIn's a, a great source for, uh, for finding the right sort of contacts. Yeah, it, it really is. And I always say, you know, I, I did the free thing for LinkedIn forever. And now I throw them, you know, Devin, what is it, 80 bucks a month or 70 bucks a month. It's some, it's, it's not a trivial amount of money, but guys, throw them a little bit of money and unlock the good stuff. Okay. Either go LinkedIn premium or to your point, sales navigator. Devin, it's my understanding. Those are two different modules. Those are two different spins, but yeah. folks take your business seriously throw them some money and unlock the good stuff. Um, back to uh, uh, another finder topic, rules of 12, educational sales via competitive research, of course. So you stay up with what your competition's doing. Reading an article in the cadences once a week. Um, as I've gotten in over the last several years to a new technology vertical, um, initially, again, going back to the pandemic, I'd read for a couple hours in the morning, um, often against the better advice of my posture, uh, boss, <laughs> you know, I'd be reading in bed with my laptop. Um, we're getting all past that and getting back to work. But Devin, this is, this is critical. Um, Warren Buffett uh, is known to read like for half a day, for half a day before he actually starts work. And you know who could argue with that kind of success? So it's it's really keeping yourself current to engage in educational sales, to then be able to have uh, conversations. And I'll give you a, a really good example. Um, a press release came out a few days ago. Uh, a client I've done business with over the years, Atira out of Israel, an RMM manufacturer. I'm in no way endorsing them. But they had a press release come out and some coverage the other day about they just uh, raised $77 million. And that gives them a valuation of about a half billion, uh, according to their cap table. But this is what you need to, you need to be staying current, right? About with the vendor side, the client side, and in your verticals. So Harry, aside from uh, SMB Nation, of course, would, would you recommend some particular places where people could go find uh, good articles uh, for the MSP industry? Yeah, 
it, it depends on what you're looking for. Okay. If, if that makes sense, like any industry. So when later on, when we get into the minder component of uh, standard operating procedures, um, you, you really want to be uh, bookmarking Carl Palachek's site where he posts up the occasional blog, I believe weekly, and he's focused on operations. Okay. Then there's uh, Channel Pro, the publisher. Channel Pro is going to be more focused, in my humble opinion, on offers and incentives and margins and, and, and sales um, compensation and that for the MSP. So they're really more of a um, where you would go to stay current with the vendors. And then in terms of the technical aspects, because remember, we're both. We're both, you know, uh, business people and geeks. Um, on the technical aspects, I remain impressed with the publications uh, Redmond Channel Partner and Redmond Magazine um, over from 1105 Media. So, you know, Devin, that's, that's a really good question because you need to have like six sources of information, right? And if all you do is watch your favorite cable news channel, whatever Stripe, you're, you're not getting 360 visibility. <laughs> All right, moving on. Uh, business cards um, still have a place. I just got back uh, uh, two days ago from the first show. I think it's been the first show in 16 months. I went to Retail Now. Uh, they're the point of sale VARs and resellers, about 1,300 of them at Retail Now um, in Nashville. And Devin, it's been a while since I've carried my business cards. It was great. I had to find them. I had to carry them. I walked around and people still trade business cards, even though we all, you know, my kids uh, will Snapchat each other. They aim their phone at each other and Snapchat. Um, but folks, this still works. But here's really the point of the, the slide is that just engage in this very simple behavior to collect 12 cards quarterly, one a week, and give away 12 cards quarterly. You get to the end of the year, you've got 50 cards, okay? You've got 50 cards and, and that's how I did it. When I built SMB Nation in the, uh, starting in the late nineties, Devin, it was one card at a time in workshops, you know? And uh, 22 years later, look, you know, look, look at where we're at. It really works. This is, this just paid for the hour you're spending with us today. And I'm going to repeat it a little bit later on, but there's the, you know, well-documented in the small business server uh, era, we had a slide deck on the coffee, um, the coffee cup where you'd, you know, maybe trade messages on LinkedIn with somebody and meet them and buy them a cup of coffee. Um, that, that's fine. And that's coming back. But the real uh, secret that's out there that's working really well are meetups, meetups.com. Um, and I've uh, done a couple of them. Uh, this is one I'm helping a client with in Austin, Texas about a, a, a meetup that's next Tuesday in Austin, Texas in the afternoon about business development. Um, this guy, is a, he's a little bit of a wiseacre. He's saying it's not who you know, it's who you bro. Um, and he's building a little workshop around it, the guy in the center with the, uh, the white trunks on. But look at that organic growth. Um, Devin, here's what's important. As a couple weeks ago, we said, you know what? Let's just do it. Let's just have a, a Tuesday afternoon meetup. Let's get going. I know it's August, but you know, by early next year, this will grow. We have essentially grown organically to 17 members. Um, myself and Scott you know, would be two, so call it 15. And that's because Meetup is a really powerful search engine, right? People go and they, they want to do a specific topic. And it, A, it probably exists in your community. So you could go meet potential clients, like maybe legal technology, um, or B, create the Meetup group and then, and then ex leverage this search. Any, any thoughts on that, Devin? But a lot of people don't understand Meetup is... Whew, it's a secret, man. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, you know, honestly, I haven't done a lot of meetups myself, um, but it's interesting hearing what you like. I've been on there a little bit and I've seen that you have very specific uh, groups, you know, and it's hard to find. Well, it's almost like an extension of the Internet, right? You know, you go on Reddit, you can find 100 people who want to talk about the most esoteric topic that you're interested in. And, you know, I would almost say like meetups, like a, a real life version of that where, you know, you can find people who are really interested in the same stuff as you. Um, so I can yeah. see the power in that for sure. 
Yeah. Uh, one, one more comment. When I wrote um, another book recently, and again, in a different vertical, I created a meetup that was a fake meetup in Seattle in the tech space. Got my screenshot. I was showing you how to create a meetup. Um, and then I forgot about it, came back like three weeks later and I had 71 members. And I'm wow. like, oh, oh no. <laughs> <laughs> I got to do something with this. Yeah. All right. Now here, this defies logic. Okay. Um, use the phone. Okay. You know, more people are, oh, you know, kids today texting and, and, and so on. Here's the deal. I helped a firm for nine months about five years ago in the call center space, a Microsoft vendor who uh, manages the Microsoft partner program via their call center employees. And they asked me to come on for uh, six months and it ended up being nine months to help them get clients beyond Microsoft, right? They, they had one big client called Microsoft and that's very dangerous strategically. Um, so they uh, had me, you know, call into some of the vendors you and I both know in our space and so on. But it's that middle over on the midpoint on the left, um, because they're collecting enormous amounts of data, right, with the call center and helping partners sell more, um, they stand by their, their findings that it's a 45% increase in opportunities. And what I like to say is, you know, are you going to get 90% voicemail? Absolutely. You absolutely are in this day and age uh, with spam and, and so on. Um, but I, I like to say, Devin, I know what happens if you don't pick up the phone, mm -hmm. right? I can't guarantee what will happen if you pick up the phone, but I can guarantee the other. <laughs> yeah. I feel like this uh, is a challenge for a lot of, especially like newer MSPs where, um, you know, if you're a technical founder, maybe you're not as used to putting yourself out there as maybe you were in a past role or something like that. And um, I, I, I see like a lot of questions asked about whether or not cold calling is still part of a, a good, you know, mix for, for MSPs. And I think a lot of it is just rooted in the fear of rejection um, that people are hesitant to do it. Um, how do you see that? Yeah, yeah, no, absolutely. The, um, let me frame it up a little bit differently that, you know, there's these behavioral uh, programs you can go through like Myers-Briggs right, and DISC to get a personality assessment. And yeah, yeah, our industry tends to skew towards uh, folks who are introverted, right? So it, it is literally hard for them to pick up the phone and do a power hour of dial and smile. Um, other people it comes naturally to, but, you know, that that's real. And, and, and so you're going to have to kind of, you know, look in the mirror, maybe go take one of these online assessments. There's, there's a bunch of them on personalities, a couple of them are free. Um, but Devin, what I found is, uh, for, for example, kind of work in the show uh, down in Nashville earlier this week, um, I come back exhausted. Now I'm, I'm, I am an extroverted person, but I come back, I have to swing the pendulum back to my introverted self to recharge. And I just share that with you from a behavioral point of view that if making the phone calls are hard, it, it is, it is hard. So as a reward, you know, take Friday afternoon off, go recharge, right? It's, it's okay. <laughs> That's good advice. All right, another rule of 12, be in the top 12% of your industry, your peer group, as we call it. Um, this is a modification from the old recruiting phrase, you know, that, uh, Mr. Client, you know, we're, we target the top 10% of people in our industry, say construction management. Um, that's a little bit of an overused phrase, but what you can do is again, go to LinkedIn in the social selling index. So if you want to write this down folks, LinkedIn SSI, you can Google it and get the direct link. Um, it will assess based on its algorithm. I've actually done a blog on this, but based on your post, based on your interactions, based on this, that, and the other, it will rank you in your industry. And you might just be surprised how well you're doing if, if you're an active LinkedIn user. But this to me is one way to quantify, are you in the top 12% of your industry? Um, it's telling me I'm in the top 1% of my industry and then I'm in the top 4% by the network um, ranking industry versus my, then my own private network of LinkedIn connections, but just fascinating and uh, really um, a takeaway from today. 
And, and Devin, by all means, if people are typing you questions or have questions, interrupt me. Uh, that's how I roll. All right, so now the minder component. So let me give you a little perspective. Um, I've done speeches before on the Pocket MBA and I've done a series and it was actually a series of six one hour gatherings. So Finder were two of the hours, Minder two of the hours and Grinder two of the hours. What I've done today since our time is limited is I've kind of cherry picked topics that I think are relevant for an MSP who you know just just wants to kind of re up re up their uh, their their learning mindset. So we're going to talk about standard operating procedures, and there's again nobody better in the industry than uh, my friend and yours, Carl Pelichek, in this area. And so you know as we start to think about the minder mentality, it's the old work in the business or work on the business. The famous book, The E Myth, is all about this. A must read for anybody. And, and Devin, you need both. Um, you know, if, if, you, if you go too far off and work on the business and you're living uh, strategically, maybe there's a little bit of owner in attention, owner in attention going on and work on the business. And, you know, the, the best example of that would be a cash business like a bar where the owner is not paying attention and the, uh, the, 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 the wait staff is giving themselves very large tips. Um, but you need to find that balance of in and on the business. And again, the key is consistency. Good book, The E-Myth. So standard operating procedures. Um, what I would like you to think about, and I've advi I, I was on their uh, advisory board, um, a large North America franchise group called CMIT out of uh, Austin, Texas. And it was really interesting that their persona for people who want to open an MSP practice as a franchise, and we're going to, we're going to steal from them. Okay. We're going to beg, borrow and steal their approach. Um, but their persona was typically a uh, male who was over the age of 50 and maybe had been in a corporate environment. Okay. And so they, uh, you know, what happens uh, your 50th birthday, you get tapped on your shoulder and they give you a severance check in Fortune 1, Fortune 100. Uh, ageism is alive and kicking. And so a lot of these people, maybe they worked at uh, HP, um, Dell, other places. So they have a technical understanding, not at the MSP level, but they want to stay in the tech sector. And so they buy a franchise. And the franchise comes, as you might imagine, with the cookbook. It comes with a lot of training. It comes with a lot of uh, assistance. Um, and that is a great way to go if you're getting into this business and you have not been in this business. But more importantly, I, I want to challenge you to treat yourself like a franchise. Like, do we have the white notebook, the cookbook with the standard operating procedures spelled out? Uh, do we have uniforms, right? There's a, there's a time and a place for uniforms. Um, do we have collateral, right? Sales slicks and handouts and, and that kind of thing. Um, I just thought, be right back. Just thought of this, but I think it helps drive home the point. This is um, a battle card that was for the sale of Windows Server 2012 R2. It has competitive analysis. It has uh, scripting and factoids for sales to respond quickly to questions. It, it has it all. And that would be a, a part of your bill of materials. So that would be in your bomb in terms of your industry and your expertise, just lay it out on a large piece of, you know, cardstock. And that's franchise thinking that you have all the collateral right there. Let's move on. So generic standard operating procedures are gonna be for any business, pay the bills on the 15th of the month. Uh, engage in collections, turn the key at eight, turn it back at five. Nothing new there. Managed services providers, SOPs, this is the world of Carl. So he has all these checklists over at his site. Uh, add a new client to the PSA, add a new user on the client network. Password management, of course, very uh, important. Talk about document management in a minute. 
but the key is checklist. And if you're not of this mindset, because you can't be at all, and, and, and I'm going to step back a second. A lot of people think they have to be finder, minder, grinder. And I'm like, pick two. Okay. Cause not, every, not everybody is all three um, personalities. And so I'm probably the finder and the grinder. And so Devin, you're certainly a well aware of Jennifer Hallmark on my staff been with me 14 years. So she's the minder, right? So you have to hire around your weakness. And I did want to kind of highlight that. Um, Devin, what I've seen in our industry is two out of three, you know, if there, there's some MSPs that are great at sales and they're out at little local trade shows, and then we all love the work. And I'm going to talk about that in a minute. Grinder is not a problem for our audience, right? We love the work, but it can be hard to be a minder. And if you're a minder mindset, you might not be the best finder. It's, it's a different personality. <laughs> mm -hmm. For sure. So it, just to make the connection to a couple of slides previously, this would be the sort of stuff I presume when you're talking about working on the business, it's like the setting up the checklist and, and this sort of a slide would be a, a big component of that, right? Right, right, exactly. And, you know, let's, let's talk about that. When I conceptualized the pocket MBA and having, you know, gone to grad school and I know uh, your boss Hartland did, we, we, we joke about those days a little bit um, that, I think an MBA or a pocket MBA should be a, a, a work on the business conversation, a little higher level conversation, right? Grad school is not necessarily vocational technical education where you're, you're doing the keystrokes, right? And, you know, the community college has a role, right? I mean, we need craftsmen and tradesmen and, and technicians, um, that's typically handled in a different format than graduate school or what I'm calling the pocket MBA. So that's, that's wise of you to, to see that. Today, we're kind of on the business. I'm not, I'm not going to show you any keystrokes. I don't have a hands-on lab. <laughs> forgive the, um, for, for, forgive the uh, fuzziness of this. I could not find an original of this, but Basically, this came from my friends and yours. Uh, I, I always am begging and borrowing and stealing when I see good presentations. So via accreditation, this was from uh, IT Glue that was based in Vancouver, Washington, uh, BC. Um, they got acquired, I believe, is by Kasey, and I kind of lost touch with them. But their thing was about documentation. That's also a Carl Pelichekism. So there's different maturity levels of documentation in, in an MSP. And I did type it out so we can read it here. Low maturity, minimal documentation. Everything you have is out of date and nobody looks at it. I've seen this a lot. Um, there may be no documentation. Medium maturity, some documentation, either incomplete or there's information sprawl. It's not organized. Um, limited strategic value. Now, Let's talk about information sprawl. It's, it's okay to use a free form database like OneNote that is not a structured relational database with fields. You, you need both. But it's okay to have information sprawl. It's just wh what bucket do you put it in? And I'm suggesting, you know, inside your traditional filing system or your document management program is it's not free form. You know, that's going to be more the, the checklist and the standard operating procedures. But sometimes, darn it, Devin, you just have new ideas. You know, you're out on your morning walk and you have new ideas. And this is almost the equivalent, like having a sticky, you write your idea down on a sticky. Um, that's like one note, right? You have to have somewhere to just capture these little free form ideas. So I'm not as negative on medium maturity um, as, as uh, the vendor was here. And then high maturity um, is, and they document all this with statistics, trust me, but high maturity is documentation as a core part of your business and you're extracting fantastic value from it. Now that is absolutely true. Um, Devin, I would offer uh, over the last days I prepared for this lecture um, because I have a structured filing system, I was able to quickly go back to my pocket MBA lectures, the six of them, and then create a custom course for you today because um, I take yellow folders pretty seriously <laughs> in terms of structuring things. 
So here's here's the bottom line uh, on the uh, the minder component. Um, you always should, and I have it written on a sticky over here. I, I test myself saying, um, so what? Okay, so so what, right? Harry, this seems so obvious, so what? Well, I think what it does, standard operating procedures allow you to capitalize on emerging opportunities. And you, you saw this nowhere faster than uh, the way we have changed our work habits, both geog uh, the, the geography and, and the workflow with the pandemic reset, right? And so there are winners and losers. And so um, one winner uh, was uh, Charlotte, a friend of mine in Dallas. Um, her uh, husband is an MSP. She's an IT pro at a very large train, uh, uh, train company, uh, Burlington Northern Santa Fe. And, um, you know, the pandemic hit and all of a sudden they had thousands of VPN requests from white color workers working from home. And let's just say the trains still have to run on time, right? Literally the trains have to keep running on time, especially in a pandemic with toilet paper supply chain shortages and so on. She drove success because the nature of her job and as an IT pro, uh, the nature of their culture um, at Burlington Northern was uh, they, it, it wasn't hard. It wasn't hard for them to respond to setting up VPNs because A, they had a check, simple answer. They had a checklist on how to set up a VPN connection. That makes sense. <laughs> yep. All right, folks, now we get into the grinder area. So everyone on this call likes to work. I have not met an MSP that doesn't like to work. In fact, sometimes we, we get so far off in the grinder side, we forget finder and minder. So the work is not the problem. And I always like to say, you know, in modern times um, that it's time to start over folks. That's, it's been a fundamental reset and starting over can mean a couple of different things. I will give you one example. I mean, the, the, uh, Devin, the obvious examples that's are well documented as cybersecurity is hot, you know, become an MSSP. Okay, I got it. Um, but I want to show you a, something that's interesting. Um, I did a book over the winter for a client uh, actually down here in Austin, Texas, in the data center space. It's called AOM. And this is something that um, has really taken off and it could be part of the MSP's portfolio. It is third-party maintenance. Third-party maintenance has been around for a long time, okay? That is not new. And the best example when I'm explaining it to you know, someone outside my industry is, you know that ad on TV to get an extended warranty for your car, right? Your, 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 your VW Golf is coming out of the OEM or manufacturer warranty. And for $1,200, you're gonna get a warranty that covers all your repairs on your car. Um, that's what this is, but it's for data centers and, and even SMB. And so what this guy, uh, Scott Lopez, what his company does, and again, there's an opportunity for MSPs to add this to their portfolio, is he took off. Uh, four years ago, I'm comfortable saying he was about 400,000 in sales to the industry. This year, he's going to cross 15 million selling extended warranties. And here's why. In the enterprise case, it's very simple. Boeing, Disney, and Carnival Cruise Lines, three of his clients, have zero revenue. Now, Boeing has a little revenue in defense, but all of a sudden, you had all the IT spin went from a data center refresh over to laptops. So everybody had to go buy laptops and send everybody home with headsets. And so they could not afford to refresh the data center. Now let's go back to Boeing. Boeing has to have certain service level agreements because they're a department of defense contractor, right? You can't just let that warranty expire. You have to have these understandings that you know, you're gonna get new parts within four hours and that kind of thing. And that's what third party maintenance is all about. And so it is um, counter cyclical. It is really taken off with people not having cash to do refreshes. And Devin, it extends all the way down to the laptops. When I was uh, doing a project for Microsoft OEM on Dell team, um, 
at the, you know, whatever you go to the shopping cart at Dell, right at the end, they say, do you want to buy the extended warranty for your laptop? Um, in many cases, that was our profit from the transaction was the mm -hmm. sale of an extended warranty. So folks, that's what I'm talking about with Grindr. You know, you know your business best, cybersecurity and Azure, and you know, you know how to work. I just wanted to open your mind today that, you know, maybe it's time to uh, not start over is a little rough, but it's um, time to uh, in increase your portfolio. I do say if you're kind of starting over, um, challenge yourself to build your next brand five times faster than you did the, your, your current brand. And you should, you should, you've done it once. And um, I, I go through the same thing with my startups probably took far too long to grow SMB nation. I'm much more uh, on point with other startups. Now, here's something you might not have expected. Um, partner to partner, and I have a better slide coming up in a minute that really defines partner to partner. But one of the ways to be a great grinder is to team with other MSPs. And so here's Here's an example. Um, this is actually an older slide. We, we did not land the engagement, but I teamed with a, a public relations, a, a lady and her husband out of the Seattle area. And then I had my company and we bid on a $60,000 engagement where they wanted both what SMB Nation does is paid media. That means webinars and banner ads and this and that. And then they also wanted to uh, be featured in print or, or in articles about their company. So it's paid and earned media. Well, I don't know earned media, okay? I, I, I really don't. And so I brought in an expert for that. I do know paid media. And this is partner to partner, it's a st strategic alliance. This is one that's gonna make sense for this audience, okay? So um, infrastructure, which is, uh, I'm assuming the majority of the people on this call, on this webinar, um, team with a dynamic CRM or Salesforce uh, consultant because they're two different skill sets typically. I rarely see this in the same MSP organization. So this is where you can uh, do partner to partner and go after great work that you both like doing. I, I know there's a little bit of a sales conversation here, but I when I, when I think of grinder, it, it also includes you know how we're going to grind it out. Um, the, the really hot topic of the day, and I've been on uh, a, a couple of webinars with Thelum Rowe out of uh, London, who is all about managed security services. He has an event company that puts on these events. So the, the, one of the hottest things right now is for an MSP to team up with a managed security services provider. Because again, Devin, at the end of the day, they tend to be separate skill sets, right? You know, you're, you're kind of one or you're the other. Um, may, maybe you're big enough to have both on staff. And then the other thing, maybe this was more of a grinder concept would be to revisit outsourcing. Josh Weiss out of Los Angeles, nobody does it better. Um, everything goes to, uh, and, and again, I'm, I'm vendor agnostic, but I just like to make my point. He's huge on using Continuum for uh, help desk. Okay, so he doesn't have to staff up help desk. That's I put it in the grinder bucket. That's how you get work done and you get it done efficiently. I can see the, uh, the alliance with an MSSP being particularly important. Um, well, my understanding, and correct me if I'm wrong, but my understanding is say like 10 years ago, security wasn't as big of an offering for a lot of like normal MSPs. Obviously with the, uh, you know, uh, the, the velocity for which the ransomware issues accelerated and all that, um, it seems like it's going to be coming more and more. And if you're not up to snuff in, in your security, you probably need to be getting an alliance like now, <laughs> probably. Yeah, yesterday. I mean, and again, I'm a storyteller. So my youngest son uh, finished uh, college a, a little over a month ago at Cal Poly, at a technical engineering college. He got a job at Fortinet, a well-known security company out of Sunnyvale, California. And again, not playing favorites, just giving you context. Um, his first day, Devin, his first day on the job, his cohort had 20 new hires that week. They have 900 job openings out of a company with 9,000 employees. And I'm like, you know, Devin, that's, that's real momentum. 
and and it underscores the cybersecurity opportunity, right? If they're growing like that, well, there's a reason why they're growing like that because MSPs and IT pros are driving that business, man. <laughs> yeah. And I've heard yeah. stories too of like, MSPs who got hit with ransomware that just literally shut down their operations. Um, so, you know, the risk is you, you can't really overstate it. It's, uh, it's yeah. pretty crazy. And it's, it's only getting worse. And I'm not a negative person, but, <laughs> you know, give me the license to be. It, it, it's only getting worse. Yeah. Um, all right, moving on. So let's talk about what these partner to partner relationships look like. Here's been my experience. Uh, and I'm in on a couple of them. Uh, with with some strategic uh, ventures. Um, It's typically in my world, it's been evidenced by a memorandum of understanding, a simple one to two page document. You do this, I do that. Um, The deals I'm in today are 50-50 rev shares. It's it's very simple, right? Let's just, let's work together and split the profit. And, um, but there's a real element of trust, right? You cannot write an agreement um, tight enough to cover bad behavior. You know, Devin, you know, you, th- this isn't your first rodeo either. And you just, there has to be an element of trust, man, or it ain't going to work. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> you know, for sure. Yeah. Nobody wants to litigate. Um, and, and so the philosophy, uh, and, and a tip of the hat to the Tokyo Olympics, I guess, but the philosophy here is that that translates into relationship and balance. Okay. So when you, you think about partner to partner strategic alliances, the relationship has to stay in balance because if it gets out of balance, the, the partnership's going to fail because yeah. has been my, my experience. Um, difficult. <laughs> so I, I tip of the hat to a not-for-profit Trade Association, I, I, I think you should at least click over, folks. Um, I'm on the panel, the, the board uh, for the Partner to Partner Initiative. Uh, we've been working on it for a year. We're just coming to market where you do a self-assessment on your maturity level and your skills. And we're basically trying to be a matchmaker between Microsoft partners. And that example I had a couple of slides ago about infrastructure and dynamic CRM, that, that is something we're doing is we're connecting Microsoft partners from different walks of life. So, you know, here in, in Austin, this is an example um, here, it's the International Association of Microsoft Channel Partners, IAMCP.org. Uh, in Central Texas, it's run by Danny Brown, the chapter. Um, there's chapters all over. It's an international um, organization. And I, I would encourage you to, to really think about it. My audience, Devin, as you know, we tend to skew towards Microsoft itself because the way I played with small business server. Um, there are other organizations, but the main thing is, you know, think anew about how you grind it out. Um, the other one would be, and Devin, I don't know if you've gotten involved. Oh, I think you have. I thought I saw, yeah, Heartland at one of these events. Um, come to you, the Trade Association. Um, you know, guys, uh, trade associations, you get what you put into them. People join the Chamber of Commerce in their local hometown, and then they're like, well, where are my leads? I'm waiting for my leads. And I'm like, no, no, no. Uh, you got to go to the monthly mixer. You got to do this. You probably have to serve on one of their committees, um, but it does work long term. And so CompTIA is a trade group. The other thing would be uh, other communities. So SpiceWorks, um, uh, I keep saying Austin, Texas. They're out of Austin, Texas. Five million IT pros, um, but they behave a lot like SMB Nation in terms of being a community and helping each other. And, you know, we're all in this together and they're vendor sponsored as are we. Spiceworks is best known for their forum boards. We, we don't really do that at SMB Nation. Um, historically, we were more of an event model and, and Spiceworks isn't really, that's, they, they have an annual conference, an annual event, but that's not really what they do. They're, they were much more of a digital community. So um, folks, go sign up at Spiceworks, answer a couple questions. Again, you're just circulating, getting yourself out there and you're gonna find good business and and someone to work with. And I, again, I consider this sort of a grinder lecture. Yeah, and I'll just add there too that uh, we might have uh, 
some vendors who might be watching this as well. And I would just caution vendors if you're going in and getting involved in whether it's Spiceworks or um, you know, Reddit slash MSP or the ITU pool party, um, you want to make sure if you're participating on these boards that your goal is to add value. Um, <laughs> I, 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 I've, you know, if you go in there and you try to sell initially, uh, then you're just going to be greeted by a whole bunch of negativity. Um, so I really love the idea of interacting with communities like this. But if you are a vendor, I just wanted to mention that uh, don't don't fall victim to that common mistake. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Don't sell into the communities. Um, I promised you we would uh, talk about meetups again um, because I feel so strongly about them. But here's Fremont, uh, a neighborhood in Seattle. And here's Beers with Engineers. And so I picked a technical meetup. The first one I showed you, it's not who you know, it's who you bro. That would have been Finder, BizDev over here. This is going to be a, a geekathon, okay? And it's it's just kind of cool, you know, that you meet up on a certain day at a certain time and talk geek. Um, heck, it may help with your recruiting. You know, I've got um, an MSP here in Central Texas with two job openings and he cannot find uh, engineers right now, uh, technicians. And Devin, I don't know if you're hearing that. I, I, I've been hearing it and then I found it um, is exactly the case. Are you hearing that about the shortage of talent? Yeah, for sure. Definitely. Yeah. Yeah. Well, this is how you hit it head on, folks. You just go out, take them 12 business cards, circulate, hire your next engineer. And another way to grind it out is um, Either you're looking for talent or you're, uh, you have a little slack, you want to go do more work. You know, you need a side hustle, as we like to say, or a, a side hustle to your side hustle, <laughs> um, are the, uh, the labor markets. So in this case, uh, this is work market. Um, and we put up a, uh, many years ago, boy, this is 2014, uh, Devin, we took a run at trying to recruit and organize talent from our community. Um, the, the, at that point, 50,000 strong at SMB Nation, we're down a notch with the passage of time. But the idea was if we could go find these XP migration opportunities, um, you may recall April of 2014 is when the operating system was no longer supported. And the push was initially to go to Windows 8, no thank you. And then it became Windows 10, which worked. Um, but the idea was we were going to orchestrate uh, SMB Nation members for little side hustles, right? And, and we did a couple. I mean, there was a chain of uh, retirement homes in um, Florida where on one weekend they wanted a simultaneous uh, conversion to new laptops, get off XP. You know, they have some HIPAA stuff going on. And um, the idea was, well, we could gather up a posse of SMB Nation members and say, hey, you take Tampa, you take Orlando, uh, Trip Kirk here, man, you take St. Petersburg, Florida and surrounding areas. So we did a couple. Um, it was not an overwhelming uh, response. Um, I'm a startup guy. That's okay. But again, labor markets can be good for you, especially if you have a little bit of slack. And, and, and I know MSPs who you know, they, 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 they just kind of peaked or something. They've stalled. And it's like, well, go do a side hustle, man. Just, you know, get, get your head in the game. Go. And, and, and Devin, one of the big ones right now, not surprisingly, and I knew some MSPs that did this, was to go uh, set up remote learners and remote workers, right? All this stuff got shipped from Chase Manhattan Bank to these call center employees' apartments, well, someone's got to set it up and set it up securely. <laughs> yep. Yeah. And so we saw a big uptick in that. Um, so folks, what we've done today is we have talked about Finder, Minder, Grinder, um, And, you know, you, you could argue, well, could I give this type of lecture to any industry? I absolutely, absolutely could. But that's the point that an MSP is a living, breathing business and you need to work on the business. Um, and, and that's really where I came at it from today. So, De you know, Devin, back back to you. <laughs> well, thanks, Harry. That was uh, that was an awesome presentation. I appreciate it. Um, yeah, one question for you, and I think this might tie into the, uh, the finder part of the presentation is I've seen on LinkedIn, I've been following what you've been up to a little bit and um, 
you've been on the road a fair amount and, and meeting people, it seems, and doing a lot of those kind of in-person, uh, you know, uh, business development activities. And I'm just curious how you're finding that so far, given, you know, things are, have opened up and all that. And we haven't really had a lot of that in the last year and a half. Um, have you, have you, have people been eager to speak with you and how have you been finding that experience so far? Yeah. Yeah. I, um, uh, I'll, I'll give you a, and it, yes, the, the short answer is yes. And there's pinup demand for, you know, doing business the old fashioned way. Everybody's is zoomed out, right? People are tired of Zoom. And that's why- so, the Sorry media... for inviting you today. I, I apologize. <laughs> <laughs> um, but that's why the meetups work so well. But let me give you a, a specific example. I, I, I won't mention their name, but a Japanese printer company that does labeling and barcoding was at the show I mentioned retail now, 1300 attendees earlier this week. And I talked to the gentleman yesterday and said, well, how, how'd it go? He said, unbelievable. He said, I was signing up partners right at the booth. This was the best show of the 10 years I've been to retail now. Obviously it was canceled last year. So you had pinup demand said, I was signing up partners at the booth. I haven't done that before. And, uh, it, and more importantly, I didn't have time over the three days to go spy on my competitors, right? Usually, you know, that's, we all know how the game is played, right? You go to a trade show and you kind of walk around and you're a little bit shy as you go by your competitor and you're kind of looking over at what they got. He said, I didn't even have time to spy. <laughs> so... But yeah, it's it's coming roaring back, and we're seeing um, all those indications. You know, the fourth quarter, late third quarter, uh, fourth quarter, some shows you and I know are coming back live in our industry from well-known vendors, and I think that's just going to accelerate in 2022. You know, people are people are done with this, man. <laughs> yeah, you know, and I'm curious too, like. I've seen a lot of companies doing like online lunch and learns and power lunches and stuff like that uh, as lead generation activities, mostly in response to things being closed down. Whereas maybe right. in the past they would have done like more of a, an in-person, like the beers of engineers or something like that. Right. I'm curious and I'd be curious about your thoughts. Like I wonder how much it's going to shift back to like, you know, more in-person or do you think that, you know, with these kind of more developed processes for the online lunch and learns and things that's going to be a more of a mix. I don't know how that's yeah, going to shake out. Hybrid. Yeah. Hybrid. <laughs> yeah. It'll, it'll, it'll be hybrid for uh, a couple of reasons. One is, I mean, we have established a new event model, right? And so there's the audience that likes the in-person events, but maybe uh, not everybody can go. And a really good example was at Retail Now. Um, the Canadians couldn't come to the event. They were mm -hmm. not allowed to cross the border present company accepted and uh, <laughs> um but so we missed out and, and that in part contributed to and, and you know my hat's off to retail now 1300 attendees normally they have 2000 attendees but you know the show was dormant for two years and you have travel restrictions so i think 1300 this early in july is is quite a good showing and and they were enthusiastic but yeah Devin, that's where we're headed it's it's interesting I was talking to both the attendees and vendors at the show and there's always the thing about, well, live events are so darn expensive, right? I got to buy the booth. I got to buy the airline tickets. I got to get hotel rooms for two people. Pay the out of to vacuum the booth. You know, you got to pay the electrician at the facility to, to plug yeah. in your computer, all that stuff, right? Yeah. Very expensive. And so we're headed to hybrid because you know, vendors are going to look at, okay, now, you know, it's all fun and giggles and maybe I'll do six shows a year, but I can't justify 18 shows a year. They're too expensive. So maybe we can kind of mix it up a little bit with some digital sponsorships um, and, you know, a virtual trade show hall and that kind of thing. But yeah, I, you know, Devin, what, what you tend to see in free economies, as you know, is the pendulum swings way too far, right? It, by design with the pandemic, it swung way over to digital. And I think what you're going to see over the next 18 months is it's going to swing way back to physical just because everybody's raring to go and maybe they have some untapped budgets. But a couple of years out, you're, it's going to normalize. 
And that's where you're going to see hybrid have a real role. And people will have forgotten about, you know, being Zoomified is bad. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and, and going back to what you were talking about earlier with the Myers-Briggs and the disc profiles and that sort of thing, it makes sense to have both of those available because, you know, I, Extroverted people are probably going to be more likely to want to, you know, go to a live event. Introverted people might want to just be at home. So, you know, they're both important decision makers and uh, it's good to have tactics to reach them both. So, yeah, makes some sense that way. Yeah, it, it literally takes an island uh, to draw on Vancouver Island. And as you know, I lived on Bainbridge Island for many years. It takes an island <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> to, to run a company, you know, Yeah, for sure. Well, thanks so much, Harry. I really appreciate it. And it doesn't look like we have any other questions. So um, I'll, I'll just uh, say that if you're watching us on YouTube, uh, thanks so much. And please consider liking the video and clicking that subscribe button uh, below. I know, Harry, you put out a lot of stuff for SMB Nation on YouTube as well. So please yep. uh, do a search for that. And likewise, subscribe uh, to Harry's channel for some great MSP content that he puts out regularly. And uh, yeah, thanks again. We would love to have you back. And I really yeah. appreciate your time today. Sure. Thanks, Devin. All right. Awesome. Thank you.